Welcome to the Food Junkies Podcast. Here, we aim to provide you with the experience, strength, and hope of professionals actively working on the front lines in the field of food addiction. The purpose of our show is to educate you, the listener, and increase overall awareness about food addiction as a disease with abstinence as the solution. Here, we talk about all things recovery. Most importantly, how to thrive rather than just survive. So stay positive, make a change for yourself, tell others about your change, and hopefully the message will spread. On today's episode, Dr. Tarman and I are interviewing Dr. Eric Westman, the co-founder of Adapt Your Life and Adapt Your Life Academy. Dr. Westman has dedicated his life to helping people with medical conditions such as type 1 and type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, obesity, hypertension, polycystic ovarian syndrome, and many others through diet and lifestyle changes. Through the clinical research he has conducted at Duke University, he has shown that these diseases can be put into remission without medications through a low carbohydrate ketogenic diet alone. His results have been astounding. 26,000 pounds lost. 98% of the patients affected by type 2 diabetes went off insulin. 4,000 patients and 28,000 clinical visits. He helped create Adapt Your Life, Inc. with one simple goal in mind, to give people the tools and resources they need to succeed in their low-carb, ketogenic lifestyle. There are two components to Adapt Your Life, Adapt Nutrition and Adapt Education. Adapt Education offers information about the life-changing benefits of carbohydrate-restricted diets. It includes lectures from guest speakers. And after our interview with Dr. Westman, he asked, our very own Dr. Viera Tarman to present on food addiction in his academy. We are happy to report that her information was widely received and they have asked her back for more. On this episode, Dr. Westman talks about how he convinced Dr. Atkins to let him complete some research for him, how Dr. Atkins influenced the way Dr. Westman works today with his patients. He explains the different phases of carb consumption in grams and the proper way to move through these phases. Finally, Dr. Westman explains why he adamantly believes in food addiction and shares his thoughts on it being recognized in the DSM in the near future. We love this interview, and we hope you will too. We've almost reached our goal of 100,000 downloads. Help us grow our show by liking, subscribing, and leaving us a review of what you have found has been one of the most helpful things that we've offered so far on this podcast. Please share these episodes with anyone you think would benefit from the information that we share. Let's continue to build our thriving recovery community. Enjoy today's show. Welcome to the Food Junkies podcast. I'm Dr. Vera Tarman, and I'm your co-host today, along with Clarissa Kennedy. Today, we are talking to Dr. Eric Westman. Have you heard of the Atkins diet? Dr. Westman is a true pioneer in the field of low-carb nutritional medicine, having worked in this field since he was introduced to the Atkins diet in 1998. That's long before the keto revolution. Dr. Westman is a board-certified physician in obesity medicine and internal medicine. He was a past president of the Obesity Medicine Board and was instrumental in getting a low-carb food plan approved as a treatment of obesity, and that is no small feat. Hoping we're going to talk about that. In 2006, he founded the Duke Lifestyle Medicine Clinic so that he could devote his work exclusively on keto medicine. He's co-author of a number of best-selling books, The New Atkins for a New You, Cholesterol Clarity and Keto Clarity, and Obesity Evaluation and Treatment Essentials, and his most recent contribution is End Your Carb Confusion, a simple guide to customize your carb intake for optimal health. The carbohydrate restriction food plan closely resembles a food addiction menu. We at the Food Junkies podcast are especially interested to hear the intersection of Dr. Westman's approach to low carb and our interest in food addiction. So hello there, Dr. Westman, after all that. Well, thank you for the kind introduction. It's great to be here. Okay, as you saw, lots of questions, and uh, we don't have to get through all of them. But just in case people don't know um, who you are, but you know, as I said in the uh, earlier on, you're pretty notorious. You were around and in the first incarnation of maybe not the first, but the first well-known incarnation of low carb through Dr. Atkins. So, can you tell us how did you, in those days, what was it about his work that appealed to you when so many other doctors just dismissed him? So, what was it about him and 
what got you? Yeah, the way I got into this, if you can imagine, so I'm clinical trial trained internist. So I went to Duke University to learn to do clinical trials. I'm master's level biostatistician, actually. But part of the training was to stay in a clinic. And I'm an ambulatory care doctor in the VA, 1998. Two of my patients lost 50 pounds each since the six-month prior visit. And this was very unusual. It was remarkable. So I would say, well, how did you do this? And they told me, one fellow said, I ate steak and eggs and, you know, to shock me. And I, I didn't know anything about this, what they were doing. And it turned out it was the Atkins diet. And I looked into it, went to the bookstore. And of all of the books on the shelf, the Atkins diet book was different because there was actually a doctor who was practicing. If you looked at there was the, remember the, the Ornish diet, mm -hmm. but you couldn't see Dr. Ornish. There was no clinic to like call up and get an appointment. Mm -hmm. uh, he had some kind of research practice, uh, but uh, uh, at least for the general public. So I actually wrote Dr. Atkins a letter and he calls back and one thing led to another. I found myself in the office of the diet book author and he was treating, you know, 50 people a day. You know, with, it was like this big practice in New York City. And that wasn't enough for me, though. I made the case that you need to do research. And if you can imagine just, and I'm not quite as old as Dr. Atkins was when I met him, but if I imagine now a young doctor coming to me saying, you need to do research, what, you know, it's kind of laughable because I've been doing this 30 years. He had been doing it 30 years, but you know, the story goes, they got this call and and he went down the hall to his staff, said someone from Duke called and they want to do research. And, oh. and so he basically offered me to come shadow the practice and then funded us to do some studies back at Duke. And even to this day, I offer people the opportunity to shadow me in my office and practice because that's the way I got into it. There's so many different things you have to unlearn and just pause on to be able to see it work. So what I learned was the approach that Dr. Atkins used in his office, you know, circa 1998. And then he dies in 2003 mm -hmm. before our second study was done. But now I'm getting the medical students coming through and residents saying, oh, yeah, my parents were doing something. You know, I was I was like in high school. And uh, well, that was our research coming out in 2003, 2004. So there was this kind of mini Atkins craze. And then Dr. Askins dies and uh, nobody wants to follow the diet of a celebrity doctor who just died. And, you know, a terrible story of someone got his death certificate surreptitiously and they put it out into the news that, you know, the diet doctor dies obese. And it, that yes, I saw that. I remember that, too. Yeah. So there are people in this world who have an agenda other than human health. And they take advantage of things like that. And but Jackie Eberstein, so Dr. Atkins dies, and but Jackie, the nurse who worked with Dr. Atkins for 30 years, was still able to help me and, and mentor me as now, you know, by the, by that time I was ready to go to Dr. Atkins and say, okay, tell me what you know. I mean, the first two studies that I did on his approach was fantastic. I mean, it beat out medications, you know, but yeah. I didn't have that ability to then learn. I just visited to get money from him. I, you know, I didn't work in his office at all. There were other doctors who did, and they took over his practice patients in New York City at the so time. Dr. Weston, can you just clear his name? He didn't die of massively obese. He actually died like he, it was a, a fluke accident. That's right. He on slipped on the day. ice. Yeah. Slipped on the ice in New York City in um, like an April snowstorm. I, I remember it was uh, Easter week, uh, Holy Week, uh -huh. and the doctor who found him on the ground walking to work is Dr. Berkowitz, who is in New York City. Took over lots of Dr. Atkins' patients. Wow. Keith, Dr. Berkowitz actually worked with Dr. Atkins side by side in the office. I, I didn't. I, so I learned this little snapshot of uh, this page of foods mm -hmm. that I then studied and I've used now for the last 20 years. It's a simple system. And one difference that Dr. Atkins did in his office that isn't in the books is that he kept people at that early induction phase, the 20 grams or less total carbs per day until people reach their goal. So mm -hmm. they 
might have someone on the induction 20 grams or less for years if mm -hmm. someone had hundreds of pounds to lose. And that's so, what I, I've done as well. So just to clarify, so you were both the scientist to validate some of his work and then you became a clinician using his work as well. Right. Well, you know, my heart has always been in the clinic. Mm -hmm. I um, gravitated toward a program that required okay. clinical care while you were learning to do research. Well, is it true? Did he really just promote bacon and hamburgers? Like, what's the reality behind that? Yeah, no. You mentioned the, the 20 cards, which is basically keto of today. So right. if you want to just give us what he was doing and what you're doing now, which we're now calling keto. Yeah. And so this is the, so you could kind of say that we helped to do the foundational science that led to the growth of keto from the medical community. Those who followed the science, I was going to say that it's a valid thing to do, and it's not that radical. The way we teach it really goes back to the Banting diet in 1863, where we teach it with a list of foods where you eat as much as you want of meat, poultry, fish, and shellfish, and eggs. And that's really where your most of your nutrition should come from. You, you get the vitamins and minerals with the food that you eat to metabolize the energy that you're getting. And then we do allow for a little cream, cheese, and oils for a variety. And then one cup of leafy, excuse me, two cups of leafy greens, one cup of a non-starchy vegetable. And it's all listed out on one list. So there's no confusion about which vegetable you know and the only thing you know is it brussels sprouts with an s or with no s i mean so it's like people will quibble about it but it no this is the firm list yeah. you know, basically any and vegetable. that's for the whole day what you've just described that's not yeah. just yeah yeah one cup of vegetables for the whole day because but is it possible that you could and sanctioned by you do just a bacon diet or just a hamburger diet like without the bun well, yes, you could. I mean, so the flexibility of what Dr. Atkins taught and what we teach yeah. is that I give this list of foods. Yeah. You can choose whatever you like. And so I, I've had people come to me doing the salmon Atkins diet. They chose just salmon as their meat and protein source. I've had someone come to me doing the McDonald's dollar meal diet. And they eat two or three double cheeseburgers, no bun, no fries, no sugar in the drinks. I mean, so not that Dr. Atkins would have endorsed an entire bacon, only bacon, but it's possible to do that. And, and I, you know, there are a lot of things you can do. I think it's reasonably good nutrition. And I hope you're not afraid of eating bacon anymore. I mean, that old cholesterol is bad is fading away. It's dying a political death because you just don't hear people talking about it. And, you know, even the dietary guidelines for Americans, which, you know, it's like pushing processed food is relenting and saying that maybe we don't need to limit saturated fats, but it's, you know, 30 years too late. But anyway, yeah, you could do just bacon. One okay. fellow came back, he said, you know, doc, I eat three pounds of bacon a day because he said I didn't have to worry about how much. And, and I said, yeah, how long did, you, did that last? He said, well, only a couple of days because the thrill wore off. So actually, I'm pretty loose in terms of the initial, wow, I just, I ate three or four bowls of sugar-free jello to get rid of the sweet tooth. It's okay. You know, what's going to happen is the adjustment may take a few days or a week or two. And then I do allow for the use of non-sugar sweeteners in order to get the true sugar addicts off of sugar to get onto a sweet thing that doesn't have the same metabolic damage okay. of course, the end goal would be to get people off that as well yeah. or, or to m mitigate it and that's another interesting kind of well you can't have those sugar-free things well how are how am I gonna we're, we're gonna get we're gonna get into that a little bit later so hold on that okay. thought uh, so just to, just to go back so your slash his was 20 grams of uh, carbs like tops but until desired weight and then what do you do beyond that like i would imagine you're still trying to maintain a fairly strict keto platform well that depends on the person and so what i learned you know when you go back to read the original atkins books and then the new atkins that i'm an author on which yeah. you know dr atkins dies in 2003 and then we're asked to write a new atkins book in 2010 that so it's westman finney volick i got to work yes with steve and on a, a collaborative book and we had a ghost writer olivia beale who was fantastic and she had helped with all the atkins books before and so there were always kind of three levels of carbs 
I mean, the Atkins language, it was induction and maintenance and pre-maintenance. You know, I decided to put some numbers around it rather than, you know, yeah, we, have, we have phase one, phase two, phase three, just to clarify things. But about 20, up to 20, up to 50, up to 150 carbs is kind of like the way I kind of put together the low glycemic science that's been done at, at Harvard and at Stanford. David Ludwig is a, a colleague of mine there, Christopher Gardner at Stanford. And so it's the Endured Carb Confusion book is not just a keto book. Mm. And once someone gets to that goal, you basically, what we introduce is the concept of, you know, you can be keto forever. It's healthy if you do it within a certain range of foods, but you might try adding back some carbs very slowly. Mm -hmm. And then of course, never go back to the trigger food sugar. You know, if you came through this through sugar addiction, then I mean, you never yeah. want to go back to that, but well, I, I think like, can add back carbs. So like the standard American is like 200 carbs or something in a day. Right. And, and so you're saying that, um, Probably a, a safe maintenance would be up to 150, but I'm guessing you're thinking 50 to 100, something like that? No, it's even a little stricter than that. So okay. the first phase is up to 20, and the second yeah. phase is up to 50. Right. And then the third up to 150. You know, but So the 150 is low carb based on from the view of other researchers, but to right. me, it's high carb. It's, it's the, you know, my brother who was a natural basketball player through college, he gets up and he's just bouncing around. I mean, so even in the same family, you can have different metabolic types. Okay. So he ended up like being the, the Dalmatian that runs all the time. And I'm more like the, right. the basset hound who likes to yeah. read the books and then go barking every now and then chasing okay. a rabbit. So my business partner at Adapt Your Life, who's in Cape Town, South Africa, is one of those, he's an elite athlete, a cyclist and all this. And he just doesn't feel good on a keto diet, even though some people can. And, yeah. and so the Ender Carb Confusion, I tried to bring in not just our research at Duke on the keto diet, but also the kind of synthesis of other researchers oh, uh, over the last 20 years. Since we're talking numbers, uh, one of the big controversies in the whole diet or food world, especially in the keto, is uh, can you be vegan? Can you be vegetarian and be keto at the extreme level that you're talking about? Like, how would that be possible? Well, it's harder and it's more restrictive. You know, you don't have access to all the, the glorious, you know, have you had the moist brisket that they have in the North Carolina? Oh my goodness. I could live on it. You know, uh. but no, you, you can't. So honestly, I haven't seen a vegan keto monitored sort of protocol yet. Okay. Uh, I do advise people. It's kind of like a rare event in North Carolina to have someone come in saying they're vegan, more common vegetarian. And we have a growing community who are vegetarian for ethic, ethical or, or religious reasons. And yeah. you know, if you have access to eggs, it's going to be a little easier in terms of the dishes you can make. But I teach that. I just kind of on purpose or I'm transparent and say, you know, I'm not going to be the one to teach you all of the tweaks on how to do this in a vegan way. Here are some resources, some people, there's yeah. some doctors who are prominent on Twitter who, who do those sorts of approaches. I don't, at the end of the day, I don't think your body cares where the amino acids come from um you know it's the carbs that come with the protein yeah. and fat yeah, that will exactly. make it not you might not be keto yeah uh, but you might be able to keep the carbs low enough to yeah. achieve diabetes reversal or obesity reversal if you're trying to get this kind of the unknown but the hope and promise about ketosis being anti-inflammatory and, huh. and helping then you might not be able to get that Okay. But I'm, still not, I'm, I'm going to sign off that you need to be in ketosis all the time. Yeah. Well, actually, actually, I, that was going to be my next point. For that, most of our listeners are fairly educated, but for the person who's wondering what is ketosis, can you give us like a a three minute explanation of what that is for somebody who's puzzled by the whole? Yeah. Well, ketosis just means maximal fat burning. It means your body is basically running on fats for fuel. And when you run on fat, fatty acids for fuel, you also generate ketones, which substitute for glucose used to be used a lot. 
So if you're a carb eater, you're going to burn carbs first. That's just the way we're built. You have to burn them off or you store them as fat. If you don't eat carbs, you know, if your default fuel mechanism is actually fatty acids and ketones. And the glucose amount of glucose going through the cells goes way down. You keep the glucose in the blood where the cells there actually need glucose. The red blood cells require glucose. The white blood cells need glucose to fight infections for the respiratory burst of the white cells. So that's where you want the glucose (laughs) is in the blood, not in the cells, which are running on fatty acids. And then ketones are generated through the liver to substitute in the body cells where they can use ketones and glucose, mainly the nervous system. Uh, But, you know, I um, remember some years ago, I was trying to just put this all together. I, I had to first convince myself that carbohydrate was not essential, meaning you don't have to eat or drink it. That was actually kind of easy to, there are actually documents that say that. And, and then if you fast for 30 days or, or now you have these reality shows where people are out there in the middle of nowhere, well, they're not eating sugar. I mean, they're not eating anything and their blood sugars are fine. They're, so, you know, you can use that as a face validity of, you know, no, you don't have to eat carbs every day. Just look at these shows, you know. But then I had to kind of refresh my biochemistry about the ketosis and that really when you don't eat carbohydrates, your body will run on its own fat. The fat store starts to open up and the mechanism behind that is the insulin is really low. And so that's where the, so the, the sugar burning and fat burning come together with the glucose going up and insulin going up. That turns off the fat burning and actually makes your body store the sugar as fat, store much sugar as sugar, we store it as fat. So ketosis really is maximal fat burning, and you do that by just not eating carbs. Right. But, and then you know, you- I, I joke that when, I, you know, when I'm on a plane now, hopefully I will soon, and I'm starting to do that, they always say, you know, is there a doctor on the plane? I duck because mm-hmm. what am I going to go, go do? Tell them not to eat carbs? You know, it doesn't yeah. help in an emergency. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you kind of already alluded to this, and I, I think it's uh, really useful. The keto as a medical intervention, you mentioned the idea that it's helpful for uh, inflammation. And so like, aside from weight gain, weight loss, which is, the, I think, a lot or a main reason why a lot of people use it. Actually, you know what? Can I just jump in with that with the question there? Weight loss and weight gain. Can you still maintain the same weight or even gain weight on keto? Like, is it a, a given that you will lose weight because you're fat burning? Yeah, no. So <laughs> I, in a clinic, I get to test certain things, right? Yeah. I'll, I'll test a few things to say. And then, you know, if it doesn't go well, I won't say those things. You know, then certainly won't say them at a public meeting in front of hundreds of people. So, so I, I'm testing out this idea in my teaching class. Well, it's really not a weight loss diet. It's a fat burning diet. You know, you really, your body just burns fat. This woman went, well, hell, I'm out of here then. I don't want to lose weight. I want a weight loss diet. Yeah. I was like, okay, wait a second. Yes, you lose weight if you have extra fat on your body. And But it really underlying the whole metabolic change is that it's a fat burning diet. So I never say that it's not a weight loss diet anymore. I'll say it's much more than a weight loss diet. It does yeah. all these other things too. And yes, actually, the, well, the I've known in the clinic that people can gain weight when they're think they're 100% strict. You never know, because in my office, people go home, and I don't follow them around. I, I believe what they say, and I can pretty much know someone's following it because the weight has come down when they have weight to lose. But there's always that um, person who's they say they're doing, and they're just they're gaining weight. And well, the state of the science is, so I've always had a clinical suspicion you can gain weight and be strictly keto which yes. makes sense you can eat more energy, more fat than you're burning and you'll put on the fat because mm-hmm. there's a little bit of an insulin signal from the protein. But mm-hmm. Sam Feltham, who's the man in the UK who put together the public health collaboration, did an N of one study where he fed himself 5,800 calories a day for 21 days in a row of three different diets, three months apart. And, mm-hmm. and I helped him write up all of his, his information in a, in a publication. And that just came out last month in the, uh, I was guest editor of two different 
journals. Um, but he, so he gained a little bit of weight on a keto diet at 5,800 calories a day. Yeah. So he did gain weight, but he didn't gain as much as he did on the low fat, high calorie right. carb diet. Yeah. And then in the middle, he did a fiber rich veggie yeah. kind of diet and he gained kind of in the middle. And this was like, you know, four kilos different. Yeah, right. So it's not like we're looking at small differences. No, no, no. But it would explain why, because we do see this, a person who's strictly keto, and they're showing it by because they're measuring their ketones, right? they're in ketosis, uh, still, usually it's a weight stall. They're not necessarily um, gaining weight, but they're weight stalled. And so to some degree, uh, portion control does matter, yeah. but not as much. Right. So calorie per calorie outside the body, you're going to be able to eat more than if you were eating a different type of food yeah. because of the metabolic consequences of that. And there was just a paper published this last week with David Ludwig as the first author. It was like the cast of, I think there are 20 authors on it, and I'm one of them, where basically it's trying to change the energy balance model of, of obesity to the carbohydrate insulin model of obesity. But you're right. I, I will do a lot of teaching in my office about mindless eating and the social eating and how I yeah. need to, to unlearn that. If you're not hungry, don't eat. Because to me, stalls really are, are one or two things. Like if you're checking for ketones, that's number one. It, it might be carb creep. So really, it's not a stall. It's you just you started eating more carbs. Yeah. Uh, but then the second reason is that your body's adjusted in energy wise. So the metabolic rate probably went down. And so if you don't automatically adjust the amount you eat, then you, you may maintain that weight. Of yeah. course, I'm assuming, you know, in a, as I've learned teaching over the internet this year, you would want to get your thyroid level checked if you haven't seen a medical doctor. Uh, if So if things aren't working quite right, there are a certain set of lab tests and, and evaluation that we do to make sure there isn't another reason for it not working. Okay, so now that we've got the weight thing out of the way, health um, benefits, just give us a three minute. Yeah, well, um, it's so unbelievable, you won't believe it. Mm -hmm. okay. So <laughs> in fact, um, now if you've been in the, this world a while, you'll believe this. If you're brand new to this, you're going to think I'm just, you know, you won't believe it. But I practice the best internal medicine I have in my life, changing the food. I can treat and fix and reverse and cure just about every metabolic problem that an internist treats with medicine. And so let's start with obesity. When the magic pill comes out for obesity, every doctor will be an obesity doctor. We don't have that yet. There are a couple of companies now starting to get in the really like put money into drug development, which is great. But by becoming a fat burner, you start burning your own body fat. And so I can fix overweight and obesity mm -hmm. without medicine. So diabetes, probably the, the big ticket item and Verta Health, the shining company on the hill in Silicon Valley that's using nutritional ketosis and a keto monitor and an app and all has demonstrated you can reverse diabetes huh. and 70% of people on insulin to the point where it this works. I mean, in fact, it works so well, you want to make sure that people are armed with the knowledge about lowering their medicines if they're on. So the only time I worry about someone using this is if they're on diabetes and hypertension medicines and they're not being monitored for them. Right. Yeah. And there's a lot of spillover into family. So I've even learned to a patient coming to me, I say, now, you know, if you're going to have other family do this, just beware that if they're on medicines for diabetes, be careful because they got to be monitoring the blood sugar and they got to be really careful. The blood sugar will come down a hundred points on the first day. And okay. so you have to anticipate that. But so obesity, type two diabetes, and often obesity goes with type two diabetes. Yeah. You know, we've been accused of not being mechanistically pure because we treat both. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. Is yeah. it the, you didn't treat the diabetes, you treated the obesity. What, but the obesity was causing the diet. Exactly. Anyway. Yeah. So type one diabetes, in fact, can be improved. The glycemic control can be normalized and the quality of life improved. And we were part of a publication of a survey of a Facebook group where they had surveys of 250 people doing keto with type mm -hmm. 1 diabetes. They were able to reduce their insulin levels and reduce the number of hypos 
hypoglycemic events. But now getting outside of endocrinology, yeah. GI, heartburn, mm-hmm. gone in three days. Irritable oh. bowel syndrome, the, the gurgly, not inflammatory, although there's a signal about Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, the inflammatory. The yeah. irritable bowel syndrome, which you see ads for medicine now uh, fixed. We have papers on that years yeah. ago. Fatty liver gone. We did a paper. So the GI system improves greatly. You know, heart disease is fascinating because there's a shift from the old total and LDL cholesterol to the new triglyceride HDL called metabolic syndrome. So actually eating more fat without the sugar can be metabolically corrective for heart disease. And that this is is probably going to be my retirement plan as I make money being asked to give talks about how you can actually eat more fat and it doesn't hurt the heart. There's actually a friend of mine, Dr. Blair O'Neill, is a past president of the Canadian cardiology group. And he's written a paper about this shift in going from the old way of looking at cholesterol to the new inflammation causing heart disease. And then the skin, psoriasis, eczema, acne doesn't exist in groups of people who have no sugar. Teenagers don't get acne in these groups of people. So need I go on? What about arthritis, like, uh, you know, getting those knees replaced and hips replaced? Couldn't we stop that whole phenomenon there? It's not just the obesity, but the inflammation. Yeah, and this is such a strong clinical signal, Mm -hmm. but I don't know of any paper on this yet. Okay. So the science behind it is that you can look at inflammation like C-reactive protein and other biomarkers. And the Verda studies have done a great job in publishing the inflammation markers. But in a clinic, the uh, joint pains often get better. And it's one of those things that I can't cite a paper about. So I don't like publicly say, come here, I'll help your joint pains. But I'll mention that in the first visit if someone isn't really in tune to that. Now, most of the orthopedic surgeons in my area know this, and they also send me patients so they can lose weight before a knee replacement, for example. And what about things like fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue? Like surely that must be, uh, sugar is a major contributor to that. Yeah. Did I forget to mention those? Yeah, you did. Those get better too. And the reason I don't have papers on those, yes, but but it's a very strong clinical signal. And, you know, one of the things I've seen happen is people will get together in Facebook or other social media groups with a common condition. And so, you know, if let's say you're wanting to try to give back, you're enthusiastic about your own response, you might just start some sort of just a small group. That's how that type one group started growing type Uh one diabetes. It's how this group of people with McArdle disease, which is a glycogen storage disease, got together on the internet and they started saying, you know, I'm doing keto and I'm better. I'm doing Uh, keto. Now there's thousands of people with this rare disease. And I helped a person with the disease to write up a case series. And then they got the researchers together. The mainstream researchers thought you couldn't eat anything other than carbs because you couldn't store sugar in the muscle. So you'd have to give sugar all day long, right? Because muscle runs on sugar, right? Oh, no. No, no. You can run on fat. Uh So if you change your muscle to a fat-burning organ, these people were climbing up mountains yeah. Before, when they were running on sugar, they would walk 50 feet and pretend. And they didn't need to do that carb loading, you know, before a marathon. Yeah. So yeah. I'm excited about the, what are we going to learn that uh-huh. gets fixed? So even the my expert at Duke of the McArdle disease the group, the glycogen storage, it's a pediatric disease. They weren't interested in the diet. They're trying to find the gene that uh-huh. fixed. So actually the program here, and I don't know if it's reflective of other programs, but I I think it might be, is they're funded by organizations that want to use their patients to find a genetic gene or or drug cure, Mm -hmm. not the diet cure. Right. Often this is the person with the disease that fixes themselves and and then spreads the word because the the academic folks aren't Aren't listening. Yeah. So I got to say here now, I was one of these people. I used to, before I became more informed about keto, like many years ago, when I heard, especially Dr. Atkins, I would always say, yeah, it sounds good. There's all these medical uh, benefits, but it's not sustainable. So why would you do something that's not sustainable? And so correct me, it is sustainable, isn't it? Of course it's sustainable. Of course it is. And when someone says something like that, I say, yes, it is. And then they just... (laughs) 
or you can say, well, what's the evidence for that? People are like, just, um, they'll project their own. No, I couldn't do that. So okay. no one else could well, do that. So. Is it possible to do keto wrong? Like, is, is it something that um, if we were to say, okay, it's sustainable, but you have to be cautious? Are there cautions? No, I, in fact, I think you can do it wrong and it still works. <laughs> or, or you can you can do an inter- internet-based version that isn't prescription strength. It's like over-the-counter strength and mm-hmm. it still works. In fact, if you do it in someone who's metabolically flexible and they don't even need keto, it's going to be really effective because it's mitigating that glucose insulin rise. And I always go back to that. I don't really care what's on the plate as long as it's nutritionally sound. I I want to know is what the metabolic consequence is of what you eat. You know, keeping the inflammation down, keeping the insulin down, which keeping the glucose down does that very well. I think it is sustainable. And it would be kind of like going back to the 1970s when these people started jogging. Oh my God, (laughs) who would do that? I remember traveling to Europe and Maybe it's true in Canada today, where there would be the American out there jogging in the park and all the Europeans would be scoffing, you know, stupid Americans. Yeah. And now yeah. there, there are treadmills everywhere and half of them yeah. are used for, for coat hangers. Yeah. Uh, you know, but you need to support a social change. And as yeah. a practitioner, I think it's be really bad if you saw someone doing well in an approach, you didn't know much about it, but you tried to squelch it. I okay. mean, at least be supportive. Well, one, one of the things that they, uh, people would say is, Oh, there's too many ketones. You're going into ketosis. Is, they would confuse that with ketoacidosis. Yeah, well, that's a common, to, yeah. common source of confusion, but that's just not what it is. You want to just give um, a two-minute why it isn't what yeah. it is? So there's a new term, been around a while, but no one else knew about it. Steve Finney came up with it. It's called nutritional ketosis. Basically, it's called maximal fat burning. And as long as you have a little bit of insulin, you're not going to go into ketoacidosis. And so that's a condition of type 1 diabetes that Mm -hmm. doesn't happen in people with type 2 diabetes, doesn't happen in otherwise... Like it just can't happen. No. Even if you're starving, even if you're fasting, and it's pure ketones. Correct. Except, now, are you considering a normal condition of, if you're a breastfeeding mom, there's a couple of reports that it's just really hard to know because... People will come in and say, I'm doing the Atkins diet and I'm sick. And the doctors won't even ask what they were eating. I mean, they'll come in and they'll say, I'm doing the keto diet. And the doctors will go, ah, your keto is bad. And they don't even ask what people are eating. So that's where a case study of a breastfeeding mom in ketosis with acidosis can happen. But I don't know what they're really eating. And I don't think it's very common And so it's possible someone did it wrong or was totally starving. So that's where, you know, if you're doing keto and you're not feeling well, for heaven's sake, go see a doctor, okay? If you're eating anything and you're not feeling well, go see a doctor, please. I mean, so. (laughs) All right. So I think we better uh, move to the topic, our favorite topic. So one of the reasons why keto might not be uh, sustainable is if they're not aware of the whole addictive piece. So I'm going to, Chris, if you want to take it on, let's look at the, the addictiveness of our foods and how keto deals with that. Yeah, I'm wondering if in your clinical experience, what degree of food addiction, sugar addiction exists among those with the metabolic disease and obesity that you run into? And then how is treatment for that different? Yeah, well, when you really look at what I'm doing, you can think of the foods that I'm giving, the meat, poultry, fish, and shellfish, and eggs, and some vegetables, and leafy greens. Or you can look at what food am I not allowing people to have. So in fact, on the wall of my clinic, I have the allowed foods. Then I have a red box of the foods that I don't want people to have. And it's basically all the carbs. It's basically, so what I do is really kind of like the granddaddy of all elimination diets. We're eliminating the sugars. So it's a, this is a FODMAP diet. If you've heard of that one, all of the simple sugars, this is that type of diet because you don't get any simple sugars. This is a gluten-free diet because you're not able to have foods that have gluten. And it's a preservative-free diet if you do it with fresh foods. And it's a artificial flavoring and artificial dye-free diet if you stick to real foods like we recommend. So, and then it's a addiction diet for getting people to totally cease the food that raises the blood glucose, that raises the signal of dopamine in the brain, like any addictive substance, it does it all in one fell swoop. 
So do you talk about, I know you have your adapt your life community and do you discuss food addiction and what that might look like for individuals you work with just to kind of let them know, Hey, in the beginning, when you're cutting out the sugar and the carbs, you know, we're going to experience withdrawal, which, you know, at all the paper or people out there who are kind of saying food addiction isn't a real thing. They're like, no, withdrawal. There's been no studies on withdrawal. They will and, say keto flu. They'll say it's a keto flu. We call yeah. that withdrawal. What so, are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So I tailor my discussion at first with the level of understanding of the person coming in, the level of desire, motivation. Not everyone comes to me knowing what I do. Not everyone knows they're coming to like keto central, you know, (laughs) and so the advanced user. So we get into the adapt your life Academy membership program. We talk about food addiction all the time. I mean, and it's a safe place to talk about it and still people will be reluctant to share information. There's a lot of shame and guilt and all that stuff about it. But in a first visit with someone I don't know, I might not bring up the whole idea of sugar addiction and food addiction that can freak some people people out. And, and that can, you know, I can just see the eyes. You I mean, I'll never be able to have my fruit again. And that's, oh, rats, I, you know, I shouldn't have brought, no. So all I'm doing is teaching a method to get, to get to a goal. And then we can talk about what to do then. There was also uh, another strategy. There was a book from Chile. It's in Spanish, the myths that make you sick. And in there, um, Pedro Grez, I I was just looking at it on my bookshelf, uh, writes, on the 30th day, you can eat anything. So he kind of, here's the keto diet, and for 29 days, I want to be super strict. And on the 30th day, you can eat anything. Well, you know what happens on day 30? People don't want to eat anything else. They're doing so great. So there's a little bit of a psychological, sometimes I'm upfront about it being an elimination of sugar and a sugar addiction. But sometimes the worst addicts, You can't hit it straight on. And in my experience, and it kind of makes sense to me, some of the worst sugar addicts are the ones with diabetes. And it's really, it's not fair and it's terrible because they're put on insulin that makes the blood sugar go like this and they can't not have sugar. No, in fact, they've been given permission to have sugar by doctors. Can you imagine, you know, okay, go have some alcohol every day and take my, you know, ant abuse drug. I mean, it doesn't solve the problem. So there is that interesting issue about how to finesse talking about the addiction to someone who is not ready to talk about it. What's your opinion about the keto bombs and all those kind of things that are, I guess, like harm reduction there, the bridges from strict to... They can work and they can not work in some people. So I don't teach that. In fact, what I teach is these products and keto bombs and MCT and all that. We didn't study that. That Mm -hmm. wasn't part of the evidence-based keto diet studies out there. That's something new. And it is not something I endorse. But if someone comes back and they're having one fat bomb for the day and they've lost one to two pounds per week, which is what I typically see. So I don't say don't do that because it typically fades away on its own. Now, there's a great area of research that I'd love to get into if I had all the time and money in the world. And that is what happens in the minds of people who don't come back. Ah. Are they having, these may be the people that you see, what is happening to the person who has that one fat bomb and then the five fat bombs and the 10 fat, and then it's cheaper to just go get the Snickers bar, right? Ah. I know that happens. I don't know how often that happens, but I'm not a big fan of the nouveau keto. In fact, it says keto on it, stay away. It's kind of my general blanket statement. So then how do you explain carb addiction, sugar addiction, food addiction to the individuals who maybe you see chronically relapsing and not able to stick to the keto food plan? Yeah, well, so assuming that the person comes back, right? I don't do much of an outreach to bring people back in, unfortunately. I know if someone comes back, they're still kind of engaged and they, they kind of have an idea that this is an issue. They don't quite know how to handle it. And that's when I bring in kind of the substitutions, the making sure that the frequency of the visits isn't so long and things won't make sense. So someone will say, you know, you didn't have an appointment for me in four weeks. So of course I had to eat sugar. You know, it's like, wait a minute, why did 
all the sort of I, some people I bring in every week. They make the trek, you know, out to the office and come see me, and they just want to be in a safe place. And so, how often someone comes back, or how often I have contact, is a kind of a level of intensity of the treatment that I do. And bringing up the sugar idea is really, I make it more of a reality check. You know, hey, you know what we've done isn't working. You're having carbs once a week, mm -hmm. it's not working. And we've done some research, and some people eating carbs, just talking about, about fat burning once a week can make you not burn fat for one or two weeks. Wow. So, so it may not work. So one you, slip can really derail you. Yeah. So, and what's counterintuitive is people say, see, it doesn't work. It's like, no, well, no, you're not really doing it. I mean, that's sort of the brilliance of the 29 day, you know, just do anything you want. And on the 30th day, you can have sugar. Well, they don't want sugar by then, but Yeah, you know, I don't use that in my office. I'm just using that as a an example of one yeah. you could say. But the fear of never being able to have sugar again is real. And so I try to say, no, I mean, this is just a method I'm teaching you. I'm not going to lock you up in a keto right. prison. You won't be able to have sugar again. You have people ever say they feel deprived, like they, they need those carbs to feel better, like they're just deprived otherwise. Like that seems to be a state in the beginning, but that's sustainable, that, that they just can't let go. That sense of euphoric kind of... Well, I work really hard to get the metabolism right. So keeping the carbs away, you know, to get the keto metabolism going, there may be some psychological hangover of cravings. Um, certainly if you see a picture or an advertisement, you may be tugged toward that. But most commonly I will hear... You know, I was even in the same room as these donuts and they didn't even call my name, you know, so that's the, but there's going to be a spectrum of folks where I don't think it's a metabolic need. Like, I don't think these are people are hypoglycemic or, or reaching some sort of crisis metabolically. It's more behavioral and something that you can use a substitute or other cognitive behavioral approach of, you know, well, how bad is it on a number scale of one to 10? How bad is your craving today? Well, okay, it was a two. Yeah. Well, you know, so helping to gauge the intensity of the urge can be helpful as well. But uh, is it your sense that some people need or quote need? I hear people saying that they just don't feel. I'm not. It's like a small subsection, and I think there are people, the food addiction people, but uh, you know, saying that uh, they just can't. Like they need those carbs to just. Otherwise, they feel really deprived. And I'm just wondering how you uh, deal with that. But it sounds like those are our people. Well, I wonder what deprived means. Yes. And exactly. then, again, I, I work really hard to substitute, you know, well, what do you miss? Oh, my bread. Mm -hmm. Well, have you made a chaffle lately? And you know, I made a ah. video on how to make a cheese and egg chaffle. And I, wow. That, I mean, so usually there's some shiny object I can... No, but, it, you know, the classic situation is someone's at home in a house of carb eaters, you know, the rest of the family is a stressful environment. And, yeah. and I mean, and it's there on the counter yeah. and I feel deprived if I, you know, that's more of a, you're still having that tug of probably neurochemicals that were, yeah. that were lit by the called kindling it's going to start yeah. to kind of start up again, the up again yeah. so, so one of the ways that we deal with that is i mean it's more than just about the food we look at the food and make sure it's as clean as possible which it sounds like that's a real focus for you do you look at uh, other venues like a spiritual approach or an emotional psychological i heard you saying cbt yeah well remember i'm i'm a doctor in an office with no staff i guess i didn't tell you that it's basically me and a nurse assistant And so the Obesity Medicine Association trains clinicians to be part nutritionist, part doctor, part coach, part cheerleader, part psychologist. Part So time permitting, I will get into details of stress management and or refer to other people in the area. In Durham, there, most people have access to other types of resources. I think those can be really important. Yeah. But exercise doesn't seem that important uh, for most people, although, again, that can be a stress relief management and then just the physical getting out of the house so you're not near food. But yeah, I know, thinking back to, it's not common for me to be able to teach in an office about spirituality and 
uh, and how important that is for some people. But we, right. we get into that. I mean, there's some people I've known for 15 years, which is, you know, we were at a meeting once of doc, obesity doctors and we're just kind of saying, you know, we know people better than when we were internists and family medicine doctors because sometimes, I mean, they're coming back every month. Yeah. And then you get to know people and, and um, that I guess there will be times when I get into that, but I don't use it at 100%. I just wanted to get your thoughts on this. I'm part of the Food Addiction Institute. We recently submitted a proposal to the ICD for food addiction to be recognized. We hopefully that would help influence it being included in the DSM. Is this something you think we will see in our lifetime? Yes. Oh, that's a great answer. Yes. Um, in fact, I seem to remember submitting something in the UK, a similar sort of attempt, uh, and I'd be happy to help in any way that I can. I think it helps to have a processed food addiction textbook for people to cite and to so that there's a growing amount of scientific data in one place that's easy to access for people. And well, but you have to realize I'm an optimist. And 20 years ago, I thought we'd have this fixed in five years. So <laughs> and I plan on living a long time. That's, the other thing. That's true. So do we eat clean, right? Yeah. <laughs> so where can our listeners find you? Yeah. So I have a website. It's ericwestmanmd.com. And that's the information that people can get that's uh, outside the clinic. There's a, a small fee for some things. There, there are links to the Adapt Your Life Academy where you can purchase classes and be part of the community there after taking a class. And then you can get uh, the directed to the End Your Carb Confusion, which is my latest book written with Amy Berger, who has her own keto community called To It Nutrition. And then there, there's some free information on the internet. There's a video kind of affectionately known as the white coat video. And I've been using that this year because people couldn't get into a group class. So if you just go to YouTube and type in Dr. Westman Duke diet video, the white coat video will come up and I go through the clinical program that I, I use at Duke. So I've always tried to keep some information available for free and plan on doing that. But then of course, it's a little bit, you know, it's not high, um, not the highest quality video <laughs> has a certain charm as being a, you know, a real world sort of class setting, but I'm really committed to helping as many people as I can. We have adapt events in the community on Saturdays. We hope to gear up next year to do, and I like to go to low carb meetings like low carb USA and keto fest, keto con, keto, whatever, just to, I learn from people who are doing this and this is a grassroots movement. Don't expect the, the change to come from top down. Uh, you can tell you're so passionate about it. It rings through. Absolutely. So we do have a signature question and I have heard some of you, you shared some of your personal story about, you know, having some struggles with moderating sugar when you were younger. And so this question is, if you could tell a younger version of yourself something about sugar processed foods, what would it, that be? Yeah, well, it's even more basic than that. It, it's, you know, what you eat matters. You wouldn't put dirty gas in your car, would you? I mean, it's just so, how did we get into this? I haven't had Captain Crunch and Cocoa Puffs in years, but they're still there in the aisles. And how a, a medical world cannot say something about this. That, so going forward, I hope not only doctors, but the public knows, you know, what you eat really matters. And you can do so much therapeutically and preventively. So I'd like to shift more my focus on prevention, where you know, the old saying is uh, you can live a life of, of good pulling people out of the river, but it's hard work and, and you save lives. But why not go up the river and stop people from jumping in? And that's sort of the prevention idea that, is, again, the pediatric world and the youth consumption of carbs you know, what you eat really matters. Mm. Well, thank you so much. Your optimistic note uh, closes off our meeting, our talk very well. Thank you so much, Dr. Westman. You are the uh, uh, keto pioneer uh, following Dr. Atkins puts feet. And uh, thank you so much for speaking to us today. Well, my pleasure. And keep up the good work. 
Thanks for joining us this week on Food Junkies, Recovery from Food Addiction. Make sure to join our Facebook group, Sugar Free for Life Support Group, I'm Sweet Enough. You can subscribe to our show in iTunes or Stitchers. That way you'll never miss an episode. While you're at it, if you found value in this show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too. Don't forget to pick up your copy of Dr. Tarman's book, Food Junkies, which is available on Amazon. If you have any additional questions, both Molly and Clarissa are food addiction professionals and work one-on-one with clients. You can find their websites and email addresses in the show notes. Be sure to tune in every Friday when our new episodes drop. As Vera loves to say, the power is ours.